Welcome to, this will be the fourth election cycle for the uh, Long Point debate. Thank you all for coming tonight. My name is Dave Emmenheiser. I'm, the, I'm on the board of the Sea Bluff Homeowners Association, and I have the pleasure of serving as your moderator this evening. Uh, first order of business is question cards. Uh, you can pick up the cards at the back of the table and hand them to either Dave or Paul Tatro here in the corner has uh, volunteered to hand some to, to me also. And so uh, um, please uh, make, make use of that. We've, uh, one of the advantages this year is that we have uh, only three candidates, and so we're going to have, have the chance to have lots of detailed uh, questions and, and lots of time for responses. Before we get to the debate, let me introduce our candidates. Uh, on my left, Brian Campbell. And next, uh, Councilman Brian Campbell, former Councilman uh, Ken Dida to his left, and at the far end, Councilman uh, Anthony Misitich. Uh, as most of you know, this, uh, the, the election this November is for two seats on the RPV City Council, and we have, uh, we have three candidates. Uh, before I, we get to the rules tonight, let me uh, introduce a, a couple notables, and I'll talk about our, our uh, uh, volunteers and, and our staff. Uh, let's see, we have uh, council, well, uh, Mayor Susan Brooks uh, in the back of the room uh, has joined us this evening. Councilman, Councilman Jim Knight up here in the front and Jerry DeHovic. Oh, Jerry's in the back also. <laughs> and so anyway, I, I, think it's, I think it's wonderful that uh, uh, we have actually all the members of our city council attending tonight. Uh, in terms of our volunteers, uh, Bob Nelson uh, serves as our timekeeper, uh, and, and we'll get to Bob a little bit later on in terms of the particulars of the timekeeping, but he's a uh, member of the board of directors of the, of the uh, Sea Bluff Homeowners Association. Bob is also a member of the city's planning commission. Sandy Nelson over here is the president of the Sea Bluff uh, Homeowners Association. Uh, Lowell Wiedemeyer is the uh, representative of the, of the West Portuguese Bend uh, Community Association, and he serves as chair of the RPV uh, uh, Storm Drain Oversight Committee. And Earl Butler, I don't know if I see Earl, is, uh, is our, our, our rep from the board of Via Pacifica. And Dave Jones, who you met on the way in, uh, is serving as our greeter, is the uh, rep of the uh, Sea Hill Association. Let's have a round of applause for our uh, volunteers. You know, I, I just uh, you know, before we get we get to to, uh, to other thank yous, uh, the Long, Long Point's kind of an interesting place. Uh, lots of interesting geography. Uh, it runs from basically Ab Abalone Cove to uh, uh, to to the lighthouse, and it includes uh, oh, thank you, and it includes uh, five HOAs, and we have everything from oceanfront homes to single-family residences to to condos. Uh, apartments and, and even the, the Terranea Resort. So it's, it's kind of a unique uh, community and, and sometimes uh, it has unique perspectives on issues facing the city. Uh, in terms of other thank yous, uh, I'd like to uh, note uh, our, that our, our city staff has uh, worked very, uh, very diligently this evening to, to prepare uh, this event. Uh, our city manager, Carolyn Lair, uh, Marcella Lemke from the Parks and Recreations Department, Mark Dottie uh, uh, and uh, uh, Liz Brown Swanson uh, from RPV TV, uh, Phil and Jeff on, on, the, on the cameras, and, uh, and then from our RT, IT department, uh, Ted, and I'm going to butcher poor Ted's last name. Uh, <laughs> and, I, uh, and then we have, I don't know if Dave Pierce is still in the room, but uh, he was responsible for the setup. Let's have an applause for our, our city staff. In terms of the rules this evening, uh, you know, we, again, we, we have, uh, have only three candidates, so we're really going to get a, a chance to hear about their visions for our, uh, their vision for our great city and uh, the, their guiding principles for good government. Uh, each candidate will have, we'll begin with each candidate having three minutes to introduce themselves. All three candidates will be asked uh, a common question or, or a question uh, addressed to all the candidates by the moderator, and they'll have three minutes to respond to each question. That is, unless they want to be a little, sh little shorter on that. Uh, and then at the end of the period, each candidate will have uh, three minutes for concluding remarks. And Bob Nelson, you want to talk uh, about the, the, the how you're going to signal well, as we... Okay. 
Okay. And then uh, uh, my my only request is your moderator is uh, is uh, please uh, hold your applause. We'll have applause. I guarantee you at the uh, end of the debate for all the candidates. And uh, one other housekeeping uh, at about the hour point, we'll have a break so that RPV TV can uh, change their tape. And uh, Mark told me that we're going to be, uh, this uh, debate is going to be uh, broadcast uh, next uh, Wednesday, uh, I'm sorry, Tuesday and Wednesday at 10 a.m. in the morning and 8 p.m. in the evening. Mark, is that correct? All right, he says I'm correct, good. So let's begin with the introductions. Uh, uh, Councilman Campbell, uh, your intro, please. Thanks, Dave. I'm Brian Campbell. I serve in the city council right now. I was originally elected in 2009. I'm running for re-election. RPV has term limits now. So if I get reelected, this would be my last term in office. I'm in favor of term limits. I see my wife out there. I know she's in favor of term limits. She doesn't want uh, me to be tempted uh, after uh, this to come back. But, uh, but in all serious, this is a serious, uh, this is a serious job. I uh, was asked a question last night uh, at an event we were at. We were at the CRA uh, endorsing convention. And I, I was asked, what's the best part about the job that you do on council? And I said, it's really helping people and helping organizations be better and do better. It isn't just all about oversight down at City Hall, although that's our primary job. What you usually just see of us is at city council meetings. Mostly what you read about us is uh, uh, some issue uh, that uh, people have different points of view on in the community or might even be controversial. What you don't see is all the good and, and fun aspects of, of being out there in the community and helping homeowners, helping scouting, helping businesses, helping the Chamber of Commerce, uh, helping families, being involved in, in your schools and being able to use what uh, little bit of influence comes from being on the city council to be a positive influence in the community. So one of the pieces I brought tonight is a campaign piece from four years ago. And it's my main piece. And you'll see something similar to it come out in the next month. But what I really want to focus on is what I believed in and what I ran for four years ago. If you look at this piece, it's the same thing that I am doing now, and it's the same thing that I've done while I've been on council. It's strengthened neighborhood safety to keep families protected from crime. We've got a closer collaborative relationship with our sheriff's department, with our homeowners associations, with Neighborhood Watch, probably than we've had in years. I know we talk about it all the time in the council. We talk about it all the time in the community. Increased transparency. I mean, we're all about transparency. One of my kids asked me, Dad, what's transparency really mean? And I said, you know, substitute a word like honesty for transparency. I mean, we need honesty in government. We need transparency. Protect open space, common sense fiscal planning, infrastructure storm drain uh, repairs. Look at the San Ramon Canyon, biggest project we've ever embarked on in, uh, in our community's history. So we're paying attention to that. We've made a lot of great progress. There's a lot of work that still needs to be done. I'm excited about the next four years ahead. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. Mr. Dada. Good evening. Um, my name is Ken Dida, and I was privileged to be on a policy committee of Save Our Coastline, which was the founding organization of this great city. I was also on the original council and served three terms. Since that time, I've served about on every committee. I'm sorry? Closer. Closer. That better? Ah, OK. Can I start again? Thank you. OK, my name is Ken Dida, and I was privileged to serve on the uh, Policy Committee for Save Our Coastline, which was the founding organization for our city, followed by three terms on the original council. 
uh, which set the tone of the city based on what the people wanted in terms of their goals report. Since that time, I've served on just about every committee and commission except for traffic. Uh, and in fact, uh, I was unanimously appointed to fill in the vacancy uh, left by Peter Gardner when he died during his term. Um, I've done a lot of things in the city in terms of negotiating the sheriff's contract that you have now, although it has changed somewhat. Uh, the Geological Hazard Abatement District legislation was something that I put forth when I was mayor uh, and uh, basically uh, provided the ability to try and do something about our landslides. Uh, my original goal, my goals right now is really to restore the original goals of the city. Over time, as things usually happen, we deviate. But I believe a city that doesn't remember its origin, its history, or its founding principles is like a tree without roots. It's not going to flourish. So we need to get back to that. We need to have more council oversight. We want to make sure we don't confuse that with micromanagement. Uh, we don't have the kind of oversight that we had before. And as a result, uh, we, the council is not privy to enough information to make better decisions. We talk a lot about transparency. Yes, there's a lot more transparency in the city website than there has been in the past. But I can tell you from experience, you need to be a forensic expert to go through that website to find out all the bits and pieces, for instance, that compose the compensation that our employees get. Even then, it's not all there. Some of it is in the general ledger, and it's not in there. We need to be a lot more transparent rather than translucent. We also talk about our fiscal health, and we point to a fairly large reserve. Now, that's a good thing to do, and we should be proud of that. However, we keep overlooking some of the liabilities. We just ran into a $20 million one in San Ramon. We were concerned about losing the switchbacks. What about Portuguese Bend? Are you willing to lose PV Drive South? We've got sewers and storm drains that are going to be there, and uh, we're going to have to make the money stretch to include those. Uh, I've touched on just a few of the items. There's more, and I've talked about 17 items, and you can get those on my website, kendida.com, where you'll find a more in-depth discussion of each of the items. Thank you very much. Very good. Nicely timed. <laughs> Mr. Misitich, your introduction, please. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Dave. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Um, Dave, I want to thank you and the Long Point uh, Homeowners Associations for putting on this uh, candidate's forum. My name is Anthony Misitich. I'm currently a city councilman, was elected in 2009. And I just want to thank the residents for allowing me to serve and have this opportunity to serve as your councilman for the last four years. Uh, this election is about, about what we have promised over four years ago when we first came to office. At least I'm speaking from my behalf. Four years ago, I talked about bringing good fiscal management into our city. I was, when I got on the council, I brought in a zero-based budgeting concept that the city adopted shortly after I joined the council. It is a tr very good transparency tool, a tool that we use uh, vigorously in our budgeting process and very proud to have brought that in to bring in more transparency looking at big line items in our in our budget four years ago the san ramon project was a big election topic well today we are working on solving that uh, project and we will have it done by april of next year it's the biggest infrastructure project in the city's history but we we're, we're tackled it while I was on the council. I'm very pl proud to be part of that group, or actually two groups, that worked on that infrastructure project to bring that to a fruition, uh, because it was just talked about as a concept four years ago. And in, in April of next year, it will be completed. The 
Other issue that I talked about four years ago when I was a candidate for city council was forging a closer relationship with the sheriff's department. And I believe that we have achieved that today. Working on the regional law enforcement subcommittee uh, as a delegate to that committee from our city council, I've, I've served four years on that committee and worked with various uh, sheriff's personnel, including Captain Anda and now Captain Blaine Bolin. He's a great captain for our city, and he is committed to working with our residents to help keep us safe. And I feel that I did my part on the, on the committee to bring that message to him and how important it is for him to communicate with our, with our residents. I've worked to preserve open space and bring more transparency to RPV. We have more transparency today than we did four years ago. And this is all an effort to make RPV a beautiful place to work and live. I'm asking for your vote for another four years. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much. And thanks. Uh, thank you for following the time limits. Uh, the first question. Uh, uh, there seems to be an uptick in crime in and around Long Point, especially property crimes. What is your solution? And uh, Mr. Campbell, we're going to start with you. But now, oh, of course, the microphone's not on the other end. I guess I had to ask the question. I guess I had to ask the question of the, of the person that has the microphone. Last night, we all three of us were sitting at one table like this, so we were rubbing shoulders, and it was a, it was a little bit uh, cozier uh, environment. Uh, there isn't just an uptick in crime in the Long Point area. There's in, in, in property crime. There's been there's been an uptick in various areas around the city that that rises and falls. If uh, I've got an older brother that's got 30 years in, uh, in law enforcement. I've talked a lot with him. I've talked a lot with, uh, with Captain Bolin and with other law enforcement people. Uh, Neighborhood Watch, uh, which is very close with them. What they're all crying out for is for an increase in the undercover surveillance teams that our Sheriff's Department has got. We've got a nationally renowned group of undercover detectives that are extremely good at proactively getting inside of these groups, getting inside of their plans, and interfering with them and stopping them before it actually happens. So some people will call for a higher sheriff's budget. I think that a smarter sheriff budget uh, and pinpointed directly to where even the sheriff's department people themselves say they can be effective would be a smart thing to do. I'm going to get closer to it this time. Um, yes, crime has gone up, but let's not take it out of context. It's a concern, and it should be a concern, but still the crime in our area is a lot less than elsewhere. But we kind of expected it with all the release of the criminals from the uh, penitentiaries that we've had. Uh, I have to compliment uh, this council. Some time ago, I suggested that we get some statistical data from the Sheriff's Department, and this council saw fit to do that, and their subcommittee is getting that information. However, there's one element that is still missing, and what's missing is we need to work with that Sheriff's Department and put specific requirements in so they can measure their performance against the requirement rather than just tell us what is happening. The other thing is we have a number of volunteers in the Sheriff's Department, and you've probably seen them driving around in the white cars. I think we can use them a little more effectively by giving an example to a lot of people who don't seem to understand that if you leave your car unlocked, you leave your laptop in it, or you leave your front door open, that this is just inviting the crime. Uh, there was a project that went on before where they would put a little tag in the window of your car saying, thank you for locking it and not having anything visible. And if you had something, they said, you were just robbed because you left something in your car that I could see. I think this is a message we need to get to the people. We can cut a lot of that crime down if we just harden the site. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you have to make yourselves a, a hard target. 
and that you do that by making sure that your vehicles are locked, that you don't leave valuables, anything in sight in the car, even a pair of sunglasses. You make sure it's locked, you make sure your house is locked. There was a young lady who was responsible for uh, quite a bit of uh, car break-ins in Rancho Palos Verdes, a woman named Jessica Costello. And uh, she is responsible for almost 20. The Sheriff's Department knows who she is. They're looking for her. Uh, they said that she's fled the jurisdiction. And quite frankly, neighbors looking after neighbors in a neighborhood watch, when coming out at night of your house, looking left, looking straight ahead, looking to your right, and seeing if everything is, is, is secure at night before you, you go to bed. That's one good thing of neighbors looking out for neighbors. Everybody did that. They would see things that are happening that are suspicious. We have a um, very good sheriff's department. They do have a undercover deputy uh, right now working areas that have high crime, um, not high crime, but you know uptick in, in uh, property crimes. And that individual goes along checking car doors actually going, uh, knocking on doors and checking if backyards are open or not. And then if they are, he leaves a note on that uh, owner's property, letting them know that, hey, you know, this is a sheriff's deputy, I'm undercover, and, uh, you know, you need to, uh, you know, have your property secured. The funny thing is, he says that he goes in these neighborhoods looking around and, you know, peeking around over the fences and things like that, but nobody calls the sheriff's department. I mean, he's, he said that's the funniest thing. Uh, how come my own department's not coming out and questioning what I'm doing in the neighborhood? And quite frankly, I think, you know, more vigilance is um, our responsibility. Uh, we will do what we can uh, as far as the vigilance, making sure that the Sheriff's Department is held accountable in our community. They have added more patrols. Uh, last year, the council added 2,800 hours of extra patrols into Rancho Palos Verdes with the bicycle patrols on Western Avenue and PV Drive South, in addition to the volunteers on patrol. So there's, an extra, there's like an extra 2,800 hours of patrol time in our city. Uh, right now. Very good. Uh, uh, Councilman Mitsitich, uh, why don't we stay with you for the next question. What is your assessment of the current CIP, the, the Capital Improvement uh, Program? Will you vote in favor of a bond to support any slash all segments of CIP? Well, first of all, I think our city has done a great job with, uh, you know, funding our CIP. Uh, the main contributor to that, obviously, is, uh, is Terranea, uh, a uh, very large enterprise that most of you live around. Uh, Terranea contributes about $3.6 million in TOT tax to our uh, city each year. That city goes to the general fund, but immediately is funneled to the CIP fund. And so that money goes, uh, goes through there. Um, as far as the issue on um, a bond, I mean, it's an option. It's definitely an option to look at. Uh, interest rates are low, and we do have a lot of infrastructure projects in, uh, in the till that we need to go ahead and figure out how we're going to, how we're going to fund. Um, but. You know, the, it is an option. It's not necessarily the only option. And, uh, you know, we keep it on the table. If, if interest rates raise, rise dramatically, then it's, it's reduced as an option is no longer an option. But uh, at this time, as we all know, interest rates are historically low. And I don't know how many of you have tried to get a refinance from a bank. It's not easy these days, but the interest rates are, are rather dramatically low. And so, um, Again, it's, uh, it's something that the council will consider here within the next uh, few months. We do have till, uh, I think, November of 2014 to uh, actually decide whether we're going to do a bond measure or not for, for infrastructure projects. But uh, again, it is an option. Thank you. Yes, and yeah, and Mr. Data, thank you. Uh, let's recognize one thing. 
A bond is just another tax. And I think we need to be very careful about looking at that possibility. We started out as a low tax city. I think we should stay that way. Uh, if we use our reserves prudently and plan something in increments rather than trying to do it all at once, I think we can avoid um, the need for a bond. Uh, unless something drastic happens, uh, I can't see where uh, a bond would be necessary. As, it, as we look at the capital improvement program, we've got a storm drain user fee that's gonna sunset very soon. They haven't been completed. We have a source system that's going on. And one thing that I've been talking about since 1983, when are we going to develop a real program to start doing something about Portuguese Ben Slide? In my opinion, we've got to stop the experimenting. We've put in some 27 wells, only six are operating because the others have been damaged by the slide movement. We can't empty the tub unless we shut the faucet off. Water is coming in from all over the place. We've got to stop that before we can do anything else. It's water coming from uphill, from uh, septic tanks, and a lot of it is coming, infiltrating due to runoff in a lot of the canyons and fissures. We need to start looking at a definitive program, taking it piece by piece to get that solved and not have to get into the problem of losing PV drive south. Um, I think it can be done. It's going to take time, but I think the city can manage it. Thank you. I think it's premature to talk about financing options or a bond option. It's a little bit like shopping for car loans when you're not sure if you even need a new car or need an extra car right now. What I would like to see is a data-driven infrastructure report card that has got buy-in from both the engineers and the experts that would put it together and also from the community. It needs to be prioritized. And then all these infrastructure projects, they don't have a, uh, they don't have a depreciation schedule of a couple of years or three or five or 10 years. I mean, you put in a, a storm drain and they're supposed to last 50, 80, 100 years. I mean, the outfalls uh, down by San Pedro, some of them have been in, I think, 70 or 80 years. And the latest engineering reports uh, demonstrate that they should be good for decades more. So I'm against a bond until we know exactly what we've got. We are moving in the direction now of getting an infrastructure report card. It's got to be a real one. And then we've got to move towards prioritization. And we've got to have community buy-in. And only then would it make sense to spend any time at all or any staff time at all in looking at whether or not we should self-fund this or if some of our problems uh, potential future problems with infrastructure are so dire that they've got to be fixed now and it exceeds our ability to self-fund. Very good. Thank you. Uh, why don't we start with Mr. Dido on this next question and maybe go to the end and then come back. Uh, what are the top two things you've done for the city that are part of the public record? I don't write the questions. Okay, uh, the first thing we did was on the council is we trusted the people to tell us what they wanted for a city and they put together a goals report and then from that we put together an award-winning general plan. Currently there's a move to revise the general plan and I don't think that's appropriate. Uh, what we need to do is update it. We need to add things to it, like Taranea, which replaced Marine Land, Western Avenue, which was not part of it then, the golf course, which was supposed to be one unit to the acre, the preserve, which wasn't there. We need to add things like that, but I'm troubled by changing the definition uh, that on some of the issues from what was the original intent. I've been told that, gee, the goals report is old, it needs to be changed, it's updated. In 2002, the city council at that time embarked on a process to update the general plan. 
I suggested that they review the goals mm -hmm. report. They decided no. They put a huge committee together that spent two years and we're still updating the general plan. The original council did it in little over a year. And that was starting from scratch, not from a document that was there. At that same time, I put together a committee of 2010, pardon me, 210 people that went and reviewed the goals report. And guess what? Other than a minor wordsmithing, it was still valid. Now, this included people that were new to the city, included Western Avenue. We need to get back to those goals. The other thing that, uh, there are two other things very briefly. One, I changed the whole sheriff's contracting process. When we were first a city, it was you bought the car and the sheriff decided what you were going to do. You had to decide how many cars you wanted. I put together the first performance contract. Uh, frankly, I got the sheriff's department to agree to it after showing them some of their own data. And it was then adopted by the contract cities. And that's what we're all working under now. It's changed somewhat, but it's basically there. And the other thing I put together was the Geological Hazard Abatement District, which was used in both the Abalone Cove and in the Klondike Canyon, which did a great deal to slow that slide down to the point that if we had Portuguese Ben going that way, we would be in Fat City. Well, I'll give you um, three things. The first is the zero-based budgeting financial policies that our city has adopted and is continuing to use. That is part of the public record. It is a transparency tool, and I think it is uh, working very well with our, our council that gives uh, the council more insight and oversight over the budgeting process. The, um, the second thing that I want to uh, mention is that uh, I was the one who pushed for the uh, bicycle patrols with the Sheriff's Department. And according to Sergeant Dave Rosas, uh, the bicycle patrol on Western Avenue has significantly reduced crime. In fact, he's not even getting crime uh, uh, reports that indicate anything uh, bad is happening on Western Avenue as a result when the bicycle patrol is on Western Avenue. The third thing I want to talk about is something that uh, happened two years ago when I was a delegate of the city to Max Transit. Max Transit was the bus service that the city was involved with, with the city of Torrance and uh, El Segundo and Lamita and that whole um, area down there. As a delegate, I was looking after our city's interests and found out that the Max organization, even though we had 4% of the ridership in Max Transit, was charging us 16% of the total budget. I brought that to the attention of the Max board. I was rebuffed. I said, well, I want an audit of the, of the uh, accounting of Max Transit. They wouldn't do it. They also wanted us to get into a contract where we would have capital expenditures that would be very, very excessive. We spend about $175,000 a year to be part of Max Transit. They wanted us to spend another $600,000 in capital improvements for their bus system. That decision that I brought to the council, that I pushed the council and recommended to the council to get out of Max Transit, has saved the city $1.2 million. $1.2 million. So I uh, was happy to put myself out of a job with those kind of stakes for our residents. Dave, that was a great question uh, because it's, uh, uh, it elicited some terrific answers. I remember that council meeting when, uh, when Councilman Misitich came back about that max transit and a couple of things struck me about it. it was number one, the amount of time and effort he put into it in the analysis. And we led the way, by the way, on what ultimately went away, which was that max transit. I mean, RPV 
was the first city that really recognized that this was an unsustainable program and in, in, in too much of it was on the backs of the taxpayers here in RPV. So, and then, and then Ken, I mean, you've done so much for the city. I mean, it's, it's hard to keep track of it and three minutes isn't enough. Uh, but you did fill a really important role when Peter Gardner passed away while in office and you were unanimously asked to step back into the breach again and, and fill out his term. You asked about things that are in the public record. Well, let me start off uh, by saying an awful lot of what a council person does and, and is effective at is both in public and also uh, behind the scenes. Uh, it takes five people to really get a crack at addressing most issues. One person can't do it all. It takes five. And very rarely is it one person that does something. It takes three votes to really get anything done, and you've got to be able to work as a team. Part of the public record uh, was my involvement uh, in expanding the Citizen-Run Finance Advisory Committee, better known by its acronym, FACT. We expanded that back to seven members. It was five. It plays an important role. We've got extremely qualified people in the community from retired CEOs, CFOs, uh, all kinds of experts, lawyers, CPAs, you name it, that bring an important uh, uh, extra oversight role to the finances of our city. So I was proud of that. Another one was the competitive bidding, which I hope will be a model going forward, was the competitive bidding of our city's banking services. That was something that I had campaigned on four years ago and was, uh, was very pleased to finally see and enact it about 18 months ago. The point of that was, number one, to ensure that we got good, competitively priced services for our city banking business. Most people don't realize it, but we've got about 50 million bucks in the bank, and that is spread out through all sorts of different uh, 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 cylinders or silos of, of money. And then third, probably the most complex transaction I worked on was the Trump lawsuit when I was first elected, and I, uh, I ran on developing a better relationship with that, which has now led to a resolving of that lawsuit and a relationship with the Trump organization that's better than it ever has been. Thank you. This will be the uh, last question before the break, and Mr. Campbell, we'll stay with you if we can. Uh, and, and again, this is another of the, of the beholder question. If you had the ability to make any unilateral changes at City Hall, what would it or they be? I would unilaterally require that all major projects and decisions be collaboratively addressed between city staff, the city council, and if appropriate, uh, the, the finance advisory committee, the planning commission, traffic safety, et cetera. I think a lot of what ends up being debated in our community could be resolved if we had earlier and more comprehensive buy-in and, uh, and, and transparency. Uh, I understand the desire by staff to do things, and we've got some superbly uh, qualified staff. If, you haven't been down to City Hall lately or dealt directly with them recently. I can tell you the, the, the middle management rank and file, I mean, the average person down there isn't doing it just for the money. I mean, they've got their heart and soul in it, and they really like working in RPV. But I would unilaterally spend more time together. I mean, one thing I see Councilman uh, Dehovic in the, in the back of the room. One, one thing that I thought turned out to be a terrific idea was breakfast with the staff. Do you remember that? That was held right here in this room. It was, when, a year, year and a half or so ago? And it was your idea. You led it. There was it was out of the ordinary, it was early in the morning, and it was one of those things like, uh, who wants to jump in the swimming pool first, you know, when, when you're on the swim team, you know, and, it's, and the sun hasn't come up yet. I mean, I mean you, you go first. I mean, but once we got here in the room, I didn't hear a single employee that, that wasn't just over the top happy that we did that. We got a chance to get to know them better, 
them to get to know us better. And I think that that positive energy really lasted a long time. I think that's something we ought to do on a regular basis. So if you ask me what would I do unilaterally, that's what I would do. I would have more events like that between the council, the staff, more, collabor more collaborative working relationship. I have to agree with Councilman uh, Campbell in terms of our staff. We have very talented people. I don't think we're using them to their full potential. We have people on our staff in, let's say, the planning department that have more education, more experience, and are familiar with the city more so than some of the consultants we get to do work. They like to work in our city. Why not give them a chance to really put their teeth into some projects instead of offloading it always, it seems, to consultants? We've got the talent in-house. We don't need to go out with that. And I would also like to see us understand how to put an RFP and a contract together. Uh, I've been putting contracts together both for government and the private industry uh, most of the 40 years of my active life. And I'll tell you, our RFPs could stand a good bit of improvement to give the city the kind of options it needs so it doesn't get into this uh, engineering value later on, or value engineering rather. And at the same time, in our contracts, we need to make sure that council has the authority. We had one contract that required three outputs. Only two were given. And we were told by staff that staff decided those two were equivalent to the three. That's not staff's responsibility. That's the council's. It's an abrogation of the contract. I'd like to see those two things changed. I would like to see a form between staff and the residents to help improve relations with our, with our residents. I think that uh, our city is a service organization. We have an obligation to you, the residents, to give you the best service possible. And I think that having a form to get better communication, to hear what you have uh, desires what you have as needs, what you have as uh, challenges in your, um, you know, here in the city, that staff can then better uh, turn around and address those with you and help come up with some solutions that will uh, satisfy you. I think that's one of the more important things that I like to see in the future between staff and the residents is more communication. And, and better communication and ways to find uh, more solutions. <laughs>